beautiful Zion that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. For thus saith Yahweh of hosts, after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. Israelites must have eyes to see and ears to hear, or the truth will elude us. Christianity will make you deaf and unseeing to stumble at the obvious and fall to falsehoods, to the eternal destruction of your souls. Brother Jonas 1 verse 3 Shalom brothers and sisters, I'm Brother Jonas and the title of this video is Christianity and the Covenants Old and New. In this lesson we'll cover Jeremiah chapter 31, Hebrews chapter 7, chapter 8, and chapter 9, all in less than one hour. I could stretch this out to four hours, but there is no need. You will learn more in a shorter period of time than you ever would in an all-year service of a Christian church. The Most High made a number of covenants with people and individuals like Noah and Abraham. The Most High chose a group of people from a descendant line of people to be his people, his children, his family, and made a covenant with them and no other nations or people. Israel is that nation. And Israel broke that covenant, which is the first covenant we call the old covenant in modern times. The new covenant that will be instituted by Christ upon his return is made with the Israelites and no other nations. The eternal holy place in Jerusalem, Hebrews 9 verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Key words here, a worldly sanctuary. Verse 2, For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick, and the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. This is where all of the Levitical priests could go into. Verse 3, And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, this is the place where only the chosen high priest could go into. Verse 4, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. You know, the two plaques with the Ten Commandments that Moses brought back down. Verse 5, and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. The Spirit of the Most High was there with the ark. We'll continue with chapter 9 as we move through this lesson. All this is simple and in scripture, but as I said, Christianity will make you deaf to where you can't hear the truth and your flesh will work with Christianity to subdue or suppress your spirit, leaving you in bondage as a slave to deception. I'm not Christian bashing or hating. I hate no one, and I don't hate any group of people, but I do hate untruth, lies, and the everlasting damage and destruction that it can cause to someone's soul, especially my people. These lessons are for my people, the Israelites, but all people are welcome to learn the truth. I'm bringing it to you now and most high willing. I'm going to bring it later, but not as a man, but as a God, a glorified Israelite. Remember what Christ told us? John 10 verse 34. Yahweh shall answer them. Is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. Christ told us we are gods. So I'm not off the chain here as I speak. Where did Christ say this in the past? Psalms 82 verse 6. 
I have said, ye are gods and all of you Israelites are children of the most high. We are gods, children of the most high and are destined to rule the world after Christ's return. Verse seven, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princesses. But because of our present state of being in flesh bodies, we must die as men and then be resurrected to our true God state or glorified state. So you see, I'm not speaking out the side of my neck. The rulers of this world and the leaders of Christianity and all of the false religions are aware that the time is running out. Simply look around you and outside of American news and you will see the beginnings of God's wrath. This is what they fear. This is what they fear. Revelations 11 verse 18. And the nations were angry and thy wrath is come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. The nations are angry because the most High's wrath has started and the time of the dead, meaning their death approaches and they will be judged and that Christ will give his reward to his servants, the prophets of Israel and to the saints, which are Israelites and them that fear his name, small and great, and will destroy all of them that destroy the earth. Christianity has said and preached that God has cast off Israel for their sins. Y'all have heard that lie and turn to give salvation to the nations. That's one of the biggest lies ever told. Look here, Jeremiah 31 verse 37. Thus saith Yahweh, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith Yahweh. Man can never measure the heavens above, although he's trying, and he can't search out the foundations of the earth beneath. So the Most High will not, will not, cast off all the seed of Israel for all that we have done because the most high loves Israel and forgives Israel and Israel is a world without end. Let's see what the most high says in the scriptures concerning the old and new Testament. Jeremiah 31 verse one at the same time saith Yahweh, will I be the God of all the families of Israel and they shall be my people. We see the Most High said he will be the God of the families or 12 tribes of Israel and they will be his people. At the present, God is not the God of all the nations and the nations are not his people. Have ears to hear and eyes to see. Verse three, Yahweh hath appeared of old unto me saying, yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. The Most High said he loves Israel with an everlasting love, not the nations, and Christianity teaches and preaches that God loves everyone. That's a falsehood or a lie, a great deception. Verse 4. Again, I will build thee, and thou shalt be built, O virgin of Israel. Thou shalt again be adorned with thy tabrets, and shalt go forth in the dances of them that make merry. This shows you the most high is speaking of Israel. Oh, you virgin of Israel. He's talking about us. Verse 11. For Yahweh hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. The most high redeemed Israel and ransomed Israel from Satan or eternal death brought on by the flesh and the sins that it bred. The Most High didn't redeem and ransom the nations from Satan. 
Verse 27. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will sow the house of Israel, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. The days come when Israel will be ruling over the earth. Men of other nations will be among us with the beast of the earth. Verse 28. And it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down and to throw down and to destroy and to afflict. So will I watch over them to build and to plant, saith Yahweh. Yahweh will watch over us as we grow in our power as gods. Now remember, Paul got everything he taught from the Old Testament. He just taught it in a way that was confusing to some people then and confusing to some people now. And that was by design of Christ because everyone was not meant to understand him. Just as everyone did not understand Christ when he was here. What does Christ say about the new covenant? Verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The Most High is telling Israel, not the nations, not all people. He said through the prophet Jeremiah, you just heard and read with your own eyes and heard with your own ears that he will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, meaning Northern kingdom, Israelite Gentiles and the Southern kingdom Jews. Remember, we were divided into two nations at that time. We broke the first covenant. We were broken as a nation and as a godly family. So the Most High said, he will make a new covenant with us. Verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. So we know the new covenant will not be like the first covenant or old covenant. Hmm. I wonder what will be different. Well, we know there will be no animal sacrifice. Many ceremonial events will end. This is the mercy and grace we're under right now. But some things will be done as a memorial. We won't go to the priest because we are priests and there are other things also. Verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith Yahweh. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. The Most High explains the covenant that he will make with the house of Israel and the house of Israel only. God said he will put his law in our inward parts. A good thing the law ain't done away with, huh? The law will be the essence of who we are and he will write it in our hearts or write it in our minds. We will know the word because we will be the word. Yeah, the body of Christ and he will be our God and we will be his people. Verse 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, no, Yahweh, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. We will no longer have to teach our brothers and sisters, the Israelites, but we will have to teach the nations, Gentiles or heathen. 
The Most High also said he will forgive our iniquity and he will remember our sin no more. But he will remember the sins of the nations until after the great white throne judgment. Paul is going to give us an account in the New Testament about the old and new covenant. Now, Christianity loves Paul, but Paul is not a friend to untruths or people lacking basic understanding. Paul speaks as if you are on the same level of understanding as himself, and most of you are not, especially if you're wearing the label of Christian. You must have ears to hear and eyes to see, or you will remain in deception land. Going back to temple worship in the old covenant. Hebrews 9 verse 6. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. The first tabernacle was where the showbread was. Remember King David went in there and got the showbread. Verse 7. But in the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The high priest went into the second tabernacle where the ark was once a year, and he had to sacrifice first for his sins and then for the sins of the Israelites. You see, this is a step process. And when you study your scriptures, you're going to see why we had the old covenant and then why we got the new covenant. It's a simple process, but you got to study to see it. Verse eight, the Holy spirit, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. The Holy Spirit signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, meaning we had no way to go directly to God at that time because the first tabernacle was still standing. A new way for us was not yet made possible. Verse 9, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. The Levitical priesthood and sacrifices for sin was established for that time, and it was not perfect in cleansing the conscience. Example, if you kill someone by accident, we call it manslaughter today, you could run to a designated city and live there, but your conscience knew that blood required blood and there was no animal sacrifice for that. And your death would be required in the end, meaning no redemption. The form of cleansing given to us at that time was weak, incomplete, and not perfect. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. So the weak, incomplete, and not perfect cleansing method was imposed on us, the Israelites, until the time of Reformation. Reformation, the act of reforming or the state of being reformed. You know, the renewing of your mind, baptism of the Holy Spirit, washing of the body by the word. This will come after Christ's sacrifice the redemption of Israel through the blood of Christ. Verse 11, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building, Christ coming as a high priest of good things to come. Christ will be offering better gifts than the Levitical priests and by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, as the temple was, that is to say, not of this building. So you see, 
the Old Testament brought in a old way, or a, a, should I say, a way that cleansed the flesh. But the New Testament would bring in a way that would cleanse the spirit. Because during that time, and even in the present, we're in flesh bodies. But after Christ came, he told us to no longer live in the flesh bodies, that we live in the spirit. And for our spirit to be cleansed or our conscience, we had to have a better sacrifice. And Christ was that sacrifice. Verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, his blood is greater but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, the throne room of God, having obtained eternal redemption for us, the Israelites. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, animal sacrifices only purified the flesh, not the conscience or spirit, Verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to the most high, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Christ's sacrifice purify our spirit by purging our conscience from dead works or sin to serve the living God and so as clean our spirits. We may live with the Most High and Christ as one with clean spirits. Verse 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the First Testament, and only the Israelites were under the First Testament, so only the Israelites are under the New Testament. We Israelites, which are called, might receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. And the Bible speaks nothing of other nations or people or anyone that give their life to Christ other than an Israelite receiving an eternal inheritance. Verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. Meaning blood had to be used in the first testament or old covenant. Verse 19. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. Now, when did that happen to the other nations and other people that were not Israelites? Never. The blood was the seal of the contract and signature of, of all parties and made all things binding. Verse 20 saying, this is the blood of the Testament, which the most high had enjoined unto you. This is the blood of the Testament, which the most high enjoined to you, the Israelites and the Israelites only and not other people. Verse 22 and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. Almost, listen, almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Not everything. Almost all things and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. With animal sacrifice, the flesh could be purged, but not the spirit. Y'all seeing the difference here? Why we had the Old Testament and why we got the New Testament? We had the Old because we were in flesh. But the Most High was going to bring us in, into spirit beings. So we had to have a 
better way of getting rid of the sin because the Old Testament could not cleanse the spirit. Verse 23, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. You see, the way we were living back then in the, in the flesh was just a pattern of things that are in the heavens. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, meaning animal sacrifice. We were in the flesh, weaker vessels, therefore weaker purification. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. We will be spirit beings. We are told to live in the spirit now. We're practicing. So as a stronger, righteous vessel, therefore stronger and more perfect purification, Christ's blood. Verse 24, for Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of the Most High for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ had to die once and only once. Whereas the Levitical priest or the Levitical high priest went into the Holy of Holiest once every year. So see, Christ wasn't going to be dying over and over and over and over and over. No, he only died once. See, these are the things that separate the old from the new, the flesh from the spirit. You have to have eyes to see and ears to hear so that you can grow spiritually and understand these things and not be deceived by Christianity. Verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, those of Israel, and to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin, meaning he would be in spirit body, to the salvation of Israel. Let's tie in some more history in Hebrews that Paul got from the Old Testament for a more complete understanding. Hebrews 7 verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High Elohim, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days, nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of the Most High, abided a priest continually. Now, this is prior to Christ coming in the flesh. So Christ, or Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High, Elohim, didn't have a flesh father, nor mother. He was of no descent of man. He had no beginning of days, or end of life, but is a God and a priest forever. Verse 4, Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are the, of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people, according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. Tithe is not money, never was, and never will be. Step away from that Christian lie. 
Melchizedek was so great, even Abraham gave tribute to him. So tithe was being paid by Abraham. And out of Abraham would come the Levitical priesthood who would collect tithes from the Israelites. So you see, this is just showing the greatness of Melchizedek. Verse six, but he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witness that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Abraham, being less than Melchizedek, received blessings from Melchizedek the better. Even the Levites also paid tithes through Abraham, as I said before. This is simply showing how great Christ or Melchizedek was. Yahawashai compared to Melchizedek. Verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Hmm. So we see the Levitical priesthood was not perfect. And that's why a new priesthood had to come. Just as the first covenant wasn't perfect, so was the Levitical priesthood not perfect. And a new and perfect covenant was needed and a new order of priests was needed. Priests in the order of Melchizedek. Verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Now, listen to this. Because this, this helps you understand that the law wasn't done away with. Some changes were made. For the priesthood being changed, since the priesthood changed, there is made necessity of a change also of the law. The priesthood being changed, there is need to change also the law. Paul didn't say get rid of the law. He said, make a change in the law. Why? Because things were done differently between the two priesthoods. The Old Testament, the Levitical priesthood, sacrificed the blood of animals. Whereas the New Testament, under the new priesthood, sacrificed the blood of Christ. The Levites had a protocol and Christ or Melchizedek has a protocol. Verse 13, for he of whom these things are spoken pertain it to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For he of whom these things are spoken, speaking of Christ, pertain it to another tribe, the tribe of Judah, not the priest tribe of Levi. And no one of Judah gave attendance at the altar ever. You see, verse 14, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Moses never said the tribe of Judah would provide service to God. Verse 15, and it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Christ being Melchizedek and being born in the flesh brought forth a new priest, a priest that was not made after the law of a carnal commandment, 
because he couldn't sin, but was made after the power of an endless life. So although Christ was in the flesh, his spirit was so strong that he couldn't sin. He never sinned. Verse 17, for he testified, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Christ is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek and we being Israelites, the body of Christ makes us priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 18, for there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto the Most High. For there is a disannulling or voiding of the commandment, the commandment of animal sacrifice going before for the weakness and unprofitableness of animal sacrifice. It was weak and unprofitable because it didn't cover all sins. It only cleansed the flesh. The Most High knew this before the foundation of our universe. Nothing surprises him or sneaks up on him. All this was in his plans. Verse 20, and inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and would not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Yahweh made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests, and they truly were many priests, with an S, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. The Levites were made priests without an oath from God, meaning a change could and would come, but Christ was priest with an oath from God. The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, meaning that this is the priesthood that will come and last forever. By this, Christ was made a guarantee for Israel to be a better testament. And Israel truly are many priests with an S. We are all priests because we are not suffered to continue by reason of death or animal sacrifice. Verse 24, but this man, because he continued with forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Because this man, Christ, continues forever. He has an unchangeable priesthood. This could not be said of the Levitical priesthood because sin slid into it and corrupted it. Verse 25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto the most high by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Speaking of Christ, because he continues forever and have an unchangeable priesthood, he is able to save us or Israel to the uttermost that come to him or come to the Most High by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for Israel, for Israel and not the nations. Verse 26, for such a high priest became us. He didn't become the nations. He became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens who needed not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's for this he did once when he offered up himself. The high priest Melchizedek became us an Israelite and doing so brought in a new priestly order, 
that would ordain all Israel's to be priests. You see, we don't have to go to some school and get some piece of paper from our enemies to say that we are priests. No, we don't have to do that because it's right here in the scriptures. We are priests after the order of Melchizedek. Christ knew the Levitical priests or Levites would fall into disarray and no longer be viable in serving the Most High and his people. So now I'm a priest and all of you, my brothers, are priests after the order of Melchizedek. We are the body of Melchizedek. Verse 28. For the law maketh me in high priests, which have infirmity. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the son who is consecrated for evermore. The law under the Levites made men priests, and only they were priests. And they were flawed with infirmities. But the oath, which was since the law, maketh the son who is consecrated for evermore. And that makes us priests forevermore. Hebrews 8 verse 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. As high priest, what did Christ offer as gifts? He offered truth, teachings, life example, and the Holy Spirit. What sacrifices did Christ offer? Only one, himself. And now all of Israel's sins can be forgiven. Verse 4. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of the Most High when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. The Levitical priesthood, service to the Most High, and the temple worship was all practice, according to the pattern of things showed to Moses at Mount Sinai, pertaining to greater heavenly things that will come. Verse 6, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Now Yahweh's ministry is more excellent because he came and made the sacrifice and offered the gift of the Comforter or Holy Spirit. And we have better promises because we are no longer under the threat of death from sins that we are committing. We can be cleansed or our spirit can be cleansed of the sins that we have committed and are committing and will commit because of the shed blood of Christ. Verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Now here comes the simple truth that even a stupid person can understand. This isn't complicated if you're willing to hear and accept the truth. Verse 8, for finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. For finding fault with them, who is them? Them being the Israelites. He said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Northern Kingdom Israelites, who were Gentiles because the Most High had cut them off from being part of the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Southern Kingdom Israelites, who were called Jews. So Christ tells you plainly who was a part of the Old Covenant and who would be a part of the New Covenant. 
the nations or heathens or anybody that gives their life to Christ that is not an Israelite would not be a part of the new covenant. There's no reason for them to be a part of the new covenant. Yes, they sin. Yes, they commit wickedness, but they have not anything to do with our covenant. We're going to process them later after the most I gets through punishing them in this present time. We'll process them during the millennia. Now, can you handle the truth? Those of you in Christianity or those that claim to be a Christian? Do you have eyes to see this? Do you have ears to hear this? The new covenant will not be like the old covenant. Verse nine. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So the new covenant would not be like the one he made with our fathers, no animal sacrifice. Christ again states who he will make the new covenant with. Let me know if you hear the nations. Let me know if you hear the heathen. Let me know if you hear anybody that gives their life to Christ. That's not an Israelite. Verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. For well, this is the covenant that I will make with the nations. No, with the house of Israel, with the heathen. No, with the house of Israel, with anybody that gives their life to Christ. No, with the house of Israel and Israel only. Can you handle and accept the truth, Christian? Verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. All of Israel will have the Bible, including any missing books, written in our mind, and will no longer have to teach each other, but go and teach the nations as kings and princesses and priests. Verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. The Most High said he will be merciful to their unrighteousness, speaking about the Israelites and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. God will be merciful to Israel and remember our past wickedness no more. You see, as a nation, we are almost paid up for our debt of sin and salvation and rest is about to take place for us, the Israelites. Verse 13, in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So with the new covenant that will come, and is not in place yet. The first covenant was made old, as we call it, and it is ready to vanish or go away. We live in flesh, and the old covenant purified the flesh, but we are told by Christ to live in the spirit, and is Christ's blood or the new covenant that will purify the spirit, so we may be one with our Heavenly Father and Christ. Israelites must have eyes to see and ears to hear, or the truth will elude us. Christianity will make you deaf and unseeing, to stumble at the obvious and fall to falsehoods, to the eternal destruction of your souls. Brother Jonas 1 verse 3 Christianity has nothing to do with us, nothing at all to do with us. The Israelites, the covenant, old or new, 
the Most High made with Israel and Israel only. If you deem yourselves to be Christians, you deny your birthright as an Israelite. Don't pull an Esau and give up your birthright like Satan wants you to do. Oil and water do not mix. Fire and wood cannot coexist. The kingdom of heaven is not for Christians, but for the Israelites. Peace, Israel. Tick tock.